everyone. A good evening from Taipei. I'm Yan Huan Li, a program committee member and an assistant professor at National Taiwan University. Uh, we're happy to have Professor John Shaw Taylor to give us the lecture today. Uh, John is a professor of computational statistics and machine learning at University College London. He has helped to drive a fundamental rebirth in the field of machine learning with applications in novel domains, including computer vision, document classification, biology, and medicine. He has published over 250 papers and two books that have together attracted over 80,000 citations. He has also been instrumental in assembling a series of influential European networks of excellence. The scientific coordination of these projects has influenced a generation of researchers and promoted the widespread uptake of machine learning in both science and the industry. He was appointed UNESCO Chair of Artificial Intelligence in November 2018 and is the leading trustee of the UK charity Knowledge for All Foundation, promoting open education and helping to establish a network of AI researchers and practitioners in Sub-Saharan Africa. He is the director of the International Research Center on Artificial Intelligence established under the auspices of UNESCO in Ljubljana, Slovenia. John will be talking about uh, statistical learning and the pack Bayesian analysis, uh, which is perhaps the most fundamental topic in this machine learning summer school. Uh, Professor Shoy Taylor, please start. Thank you very much for your kind introduction, mm -hmm. uh, Professor Li and Yin Huan. It's really uh, great to be here. Very happy that you uh, thought to invite me. And uh, although it's all remote, of course, it would have been great to be in Taipei, but uh, uh, it's great also to take part in such a, uh, a meeting, even if it is remotely. So uh, today's uh, talk, I'm going to try to cover off the basics of what we're trying to do in statistical learning theory, and then move on uh, with a brief review of earlier approaches to talk about the fact Bayesian analysis, which I think is uh, probably the most uh, effective and flexible in the way that it treats uh, the analysis of, of learning. So I think it's also one that holds prospects of you know, greater uh, range of application, let's say. Uh, so hopefully it will also uh, excite you to think about problems in this area. So uh, let me start with trying to motivate the, um, the reason that uh, theoretical approaches to learning are worth considering. Oh, before I do start, sorry, there, there is a, a way of putting questions. I don't exactly know how you do it, but please feel free to pop questions at any time. And I think I will see them in the chat. I'll try to keep an eye on them and uh, I'll try to respond if I can immediately or, or come back later if uh, it might take a bit more time. Uh, so, uh, as I said, learning, um, the theory of learning is really to try to grapple with the fundamental question of how do we understand uh, what learning is doing and verify that is, it is what it is uh, setting out to do, it, it is achieving. And the fundamental thing we're trying to do in learning is to take some finite set of data, examples, information, and process it in a way that we will then perform uh, well on data that we are, are yet to see, that may not even yet have been uh, produced, uh, so that we're able to apply the, the thing that we learn, the function, the classifier, the regressor, the agent, whatever it might be, in an environment uh, which it has yet, uh, has not previously experienced. Uh, and then, uh, we want to be able to be confident that what it has learned will, what we say is generalize to that situation. So we want to be assessing the degree to which from that finite set of data, the method has extracted something that is more fundamental, more general than that particular set of data. And, you know, there's, here's a kind of illustration that I think uh, gives an intuition. We've got some red and 
uh, blue dots here. And there's a very natural line that seems to distinguish them, that is the black line. Uh, but if you want to actually get all of the red and black blue dots correctly uh, classified by a line, you have to produce something much more uh, intricate and uh, convoluted, which is the green line. And so the question that you want to ask and which the theory should try to answer is which is better um, and which is likely to do better on new data. And uh, the, the expectation is that the black line, because of its simplicity, is probably the correct one. And the misclassifications are simply due to uh, randomness in the data. The data maybe has errors. There might be misclassifications in the labeling, etc which have caused the small number of uh, incorrectly classified dots on, uh, by the black line to be on the wrong side of that boundary. So from examples, what can a system learn about the underlying phenomenon? Notice underlying phenomenon is something that we're trying to capture. And if we're memorizing already seen data, that's probably a bad idea because it will lead to overfitting. And so generalization, as I've said, is the ability to perform well on unseen data. So the other thing to think about here is what would happen if we got a second data set? So here, think of this as one set of data that we've been given. And now uh, we generate a new data set. So the same number of data points, perhaps, but uh, you know, generated uh, from the same distribution from the same phenomenon we're trying to model, uh, what would happen? Would we get exactly the same line? Would we actually uh, have a very different classification? Um, so this is something that, uh, and, and what would be its performance on new data? So this is something that is at the heart of statistical learning theory, and why we talk about learning with high confidence. So I'm going to try to introduce that idea on this slide. So think about uh, a fixed algorithm, uh, a fixed function class, and a fixed sample size. And we now think about running this particular algorithm and, and, and approach with uh, different samples. So each time we generate a new sample, and we actually use that as our training data, and we run our algorithm, we get a, a, a function, and that function will have a test error. Uh, we could think of it on some fixed test set, or we could think of it as the probability of misclassifying a, a, a randomly drawn uh, test point. So as we run the algorithm with different training sets, we will get different test errors. Just by the luck of the training set, maybe giving us a better guide to finding a, a good function, or perhaps uh, a, a worse because of the particular configuration of the data points is misleading us. So here we saw these points. Um, I hope you can see my point uh, cursor, but these ones are potentially misleading us. They might be, you know, effectively errors uh, in, the, in the labeling perhaps. And so if there are a number of more of these points or they're more correlated, we may get more uh, misled by them and end up with a poor performance as a result. So as we get each training set will lead to a particular test error. So we can think of the generation of random training sets as generating a distribution of test errors. And the question we want to ask is how should we think about uh, those test errors uh, or rather that error distribution? One thing we could think about is the mean of that distribution. And perhaps we could design algorithms that optimize the mean of that distribution. Uh, but statistical learning theory takes the view that that is, uh, can be misleading. And it may lead to algorithms that on average do very well, but uh, there are a significant number of training sets. Remember here, the distribution is generated by the training sets. A significant number of training sets where we do very poorly uh, and have very poor generalization. Now, of course, when we are a learner, we actually only have one training set. We are given one set of data. So we don't have the luxury 
of saying, well, we didn't like that training set, give me another, give me another. We have one training set. Um, and so if that training set is uh, misleading us, then we're in deep trouble. So we want a method that is more robust and is able to learn reliably from just one training set, not that does well on average over all training sets. So this is actually asking about the tail of that distribution of errors. So it's saying we want to ensure that the chances of us actually doing poorly, having a poor generalization, is uh, kept, as, uh, kept as low as possible. And so we want to look at the tail of this distribution of test errors, and we want to find bounds that hold with high probability. So, okay, there's a tail of the distribution. We might be very unlucky. Some, you know, 5%, 2%, 1% of training sets could mislead us. But 95% of the time, we're going to have an error bound that's better than this quantity. And we're trying to optimize that sometimes called worst case or, you know, not such a, you know, the, the, the high risk case, we're trying to reduce the risk of doing worse than that value. And that's finding those bounds which hold with high probability over random samples, random training sets of size N, where N is some fixed size. So this is comparable to a statistical test. When you say, you know, 99% 90, confidence interval, what you're trying, uh, what you're uh, saying is that the chances that the conclusion you draw uh, is not true is less than 1%. And we're doing exactly the same here. We're saying that the function we've learned, the chances that its error is worse than our bound is less than 1%. And this comes, leads us to the uh, acronym PAC, which means probably approximately correct. Uh, and what it refers to is the probably is this uh, confidence, in other words, the chance of us being misled by the data set being small, that's the probably, and approximately correct is the error rate that we are able to achieve with that probability. So the, the bound on the generalization performance that we will achieve with that probability. And there's usually uh, a a confidence parameter delta that's used to control, to, to denote the probability uh, that we are misled. So the probability of over our uh, M sample, which is drawn uniformly, uh, uh, sorry, identically, so P to the M, uh, of generating a large error, that training set generates a large error, is less than or equal to delta. This is the tail of the distribution. Uh, delta is the probability of being misled by the training set. So although it doesn't sound very com comforting, probably approximately correct, it does capture very nicely this high confidence bound that we will want to achieve in order to be confident that on our one training set that we're given, we get good performance. And I'll show you now a, uh, so it, it, turning it around, it, the high confidence says the probability uh, that we're approximately correct is greater than or equal to one minus delta. In other words, the probability that there's a large error is less than delta. And here's an example taken from uh, of that distribution with two different learning algorithms. The red algorithm is an SP, a support vector machine, and the blue is a pars and window estimator. Uh, the data set is the breast cancer data set from the UCI repository. And we're using just linear classifiers. So it's the SVM with a linear kernel. And we're asking, uh, uh, I've forgotten the size of the, of the training set, but it's some uh, reasonable size training set. And we're repeatedly drawing random training sets of that size and uh, training the classifier, bars and window or SVM, and then measuring its performance on the left out data. And what we can see is that the Parson window has this much more uh, diffuse tail, uh, whereas actually the means of the distributions, these are the distributions of errors. So we're just, this is a density over, I think, uh, maybe a thousand runs uh, of the running the algorithm on a, on, on a data set. 
and estimating its performance and keeping a histogram of those errors. Um, and what we can see is that the means of those two distributions are actually very close. Uh, those are those two circles uh, here on the line. Um, there's not much to choose between them, but if we look at the 95th percentile of the distributions, there's actually a big difference. The SVM has significantly brought down the risk that you could end up with a, a high error in the particular training set that you generated. And that's exactly what statistical learning theory is attempting to do. So I noticed there's a, a question in the chat, sorry. So uh, I will come to uh, fact learning for uh, deep learning. The question, sorry, I should read the question because maybe others don't see it. Uniform convergence seems like a poor framework to describe deep neural networks generalization because we actually don't search among all hypotheses, but only among those close to a specific kind. It can be proven that SGD doesn't move much far from the starting initialization. In view of this fact, is packed learning really relevant to deep learning? So uh, I would say in one sense, you're right, Andrea, uh, but actually that's precisely the the power of the uh, Pat Bayesian uh, analysis that actually enables us to take account of that prior. Uh, and actually, we'll see in the end of the, uh, this tutorial that we actually do get very good bounds, even for deep networks using that approach. So uh, in one sense, you're right, but uh, actually the, the Pat Bayesian framework um, is, is, is able to handle that. And there's a further question. The test error depends on two random vectors, the training set and the test set. When we talk about the distribution of test errors, do we keep the test set fixed and consider random training sets or do we vary both training and test set? So test error, I'm thinking of the test error as the true generalization. In other words, the, if you have a, an infinite set, you know, you're randomly generating data from a distribution, your probability of misclassification. Of course, in practice, you typically have a test set, which is a particular sample from that distribution. And therefore you have a, a test of that. The, the difference between the training and the test uh, estimation is that in the training set, you're using the training, error, uh, training set to choose your function. And so you're typically getting a much biased, very biased estimate uh, of the generalization. And that's precisely why you need generalization theory. On the test set, you're only using it once just to evaluate the function. And you can use a test set error bound uh, to generate, you know, to estimate from that empirical performance on the test set, the true, the bound of the true uh, error. I'm not gonna go into that because it's such a tight bound in that case that it really is quite okay to just treat the uh, performance on the test set as the true error. But you're absolutely right. The true error should be seen as the true performance on, a, on the uh, in the distribution sense of the uh, of the uh, of the uh, classifier, whatever. But I hope that answers your question, Andre. Thanks. Keep keep the questions coming. They're great questions. Uh, okay. So I'm now uh, having said. Hopefully, I've set the scene now, uh, and I think it's fair to say, I mean, just to sort of, I'm going to focus mostly on classification, but in learning, everything we do is about trying to make inferences from finite sets of data. So what I say may, you know, in specifics may re refer very closely to that particular application, but I, I think the ideas are essential in the sense that we're always trying to move from a finite sample to some inference about the underlying process. Uh, and of course, it's much easier if we have something uh, as simple as classification, which is why I'm going to concentrate on that. But the principle of the ideas uh, should also generalize to other uh, situations. Okay, so the mathematical formulation, we're going to think of Another, a learning algorithm as taking a data set, which is going to be uh, uh, a set of pairs of inputs and outputs. 
um, which could be labels, but could be. Uh, we're going to imagine that there's a class of functions, predictors. In the case of a deep network, it would be the parameterizations of the deep network. Um, and we, given the input vectors, it maps to a function in the class. There could be a randomized function that's determined to some extent by the random initialization or some random processes, but it's a, we think of it as a function mapping this training set to a, a function in the hypothesis class. Training set, as I said, is a, a, a set of input output examples. I'm gonna try and be consistent and use M for the number of those examples. Um, and these are key assumptions that we're going to make. Um, and that is that there is a data generating distribution that is generating those input output pairs. Uh, that distribution is, you know, kind of hides a lot. So, uh, so it's not, you know, it's quite a complex, potentially very complex distribution. Uh, we make no assumptions about the distribution or very benign assumptions about the distribution. The key assumption we make is not about the distribution itself, but about the way it's used to generate the training data. And that is that they are generated independently uh, and identically. So they're all generated according to P, um, uh, but there's no relationship between the uh, individual examples. So the choice of the first example does not influence the choice of the second. Now in many applications, that won't be the case. Um, so this is a, you know, something that would need to be addressed if we were applying to say sequence data. Uh, now there are analyses that, uh, statistical learning theory analyses that uh, look into that. Um, and typically what happens is there's uh, an estimation of a mixing time and essentially what we can do is assume examples are independent, provided they're separated by uh, at least uh, as long as the mixing time. Uh, so that is the typical approach to non-IID analysis, but I will not be looking into that uh, in the tutorial today. Um, I'm going to be making the assumption that the examples are generated by ID. Um, as I say, mostly beyond the scope of this tutorial. Okay, so what do we want to achieve from the sample? Uh, so as I've already indicated, we, we're thinking of an algorithm generating a predictor, uh, but what statistical learning theory to do, would like to also do is certify that predictor's performance. So we just, we want to have an algorithm that hopefully will generate a good predictor, but we also want to have, if we can, some uh, certificate number, uh, which will tell us how good that predictor's performance will be on this new data, again, drawn according to the same distribution. So the data generating distribution is of course also the distribution generating the test data. And we can think of it as just then the test performance is simply the probability of a randomly generated test example being misclassified or the expected squared norm error or whatever it might be. So, uh, Learning a predictor means an algorithm driven by some learning principle, informed maybe by prior knowledge, uh, which will give us an inductive bias. And certifying a performance is what happens beyond the training data and the generalization bounds that I've referred to, uh, indicating the kind of performance we would expect uh, with high probability, you know, with that uh, high confidence that I introduced at the beginning. Now, the interesting thing is that these two goals actually interact with each other, and we will see that happening. So if we can get a good certificate uh, method, that can actually inform a learning algorithm because it can drive what we should optimize in the learning algorithm. Um, and clearly a good learning algorithm will hopefully result in a good certificate. So that's not always the case, but uh, that's uh, certainly we would hope that those two would be very interlocked. So the actual measure of performance is typically a loss function, uh, which is used to measure the discrepancy between the predicted output and the true output, um, the one that's in the training data or in the test data. Um, and we break that into empirical, so the average of that on the training data and the 
true risk, which is the expectation of that risk on a randomly generated test point uh, drawn according to the same distribution out of sample. Uh, and as I already indicated in uh, my answer to Andrea's second question, you know, we typically uh, replace this with a test average uh, empirical risk on a test set. Uh, but these two are very tightly connected because we're not, our algorithm is not driving to improve the test empirical test error, whereas it is driving to improve the empirical uh, training error. And that's why there's the danger of the uh, separation between the true risk and the empirical risk in the training data. So examples of the loss functions, the zero one loss, obviously classification, squared loss for regression, hinge loss, which is used in, for example, the small vector machine training, uh, log loss, which could be used for density estimation, et cetera. So uh, and notice here, there isn't that this Y is a kind of dummy variable because we're actually only, uh, it's, a, it's an unsupervised learning problem. Okay, so if a predictor H does well on the in-sample XY pairs, will it still do well on the out-of-sample pairs? And I've already indicated maybe not because it may be fine-tuned too much to do well on the training set uh, at the expense of actually capturing underlying phenomena. Um, so this is uh, referred to this difference between the uh, in-sample an empirical error and the out of sample true generalization error is known as a generalization gap. Um, and the question is can we provide bounds that of the form with high probability this gap is less than or equal to some small quantity, which may be a function of the sample size and our confidence parameter delta, uh, uh, which is controlling the probability that this might not be true. Um, and that would lead to a, a bound of the form. The true error is less than or equal to the empirical error plus this, uh, this gap uh, bound. Uh, and that is holding uh, with high probability. So this is not a strict inequality, it's a with high probability inequality. Um, and we can also think about lower bounds that the gap may be with high probability greater than uh, some epsilon tilde and delta. And uh, there are various flavors uh, of bounds, um, distribution free, distribution dependent uh, as the first sort of distinction. Uh, distribution free is of the type I indicated where I said we make no assumptions about the distribution P um, or very benign assumptions. So P is the distribution generating the data. Uh, this typically, you know, captures all of the real world complexities. So for example, if you had pictures of uh, cells and you were trying to classify whether the cell was cancerous or not, that's a you know, classification problem. Um, the distribution P is essentially uh, two distributions here, the distribution that generates normal cells and the distribution that generates cancerous cells. And these are, you know, as you can imagine, extremely complex distributions, which would be, you know, involving all of the processes within the cell, the different types of cancer, the different ways in which the cancer affects the growth of the cell, et cetera, et cetera. So these are very, potentially very complex distributions. So this theory of, if you make it distribution free, is very general. Uh, as I said, the only distribution, the only assumption is this IID assumption. Uh, but there may be situations where you have more precise knowledge about the distribution. And so you might want to move to distribution dependent. Um, and this has been done quite often for theoretical reasons to try to understand the degree to which that's in certain situations, assumptions about the distribution can you know, improve or, or make learning possible. Uh, so these are then distributions that would have to make some you know, particular assumptions. But as I indicated, real world data, uh, it's kind of unbelievable that you would be able to capture the real properties of the distribution. So I would, I would argue that distribution dependent is interesting from a theoretical point of view, 
but not so interesting for many real world serious applications. Uh, the distribution free assumption is a very good one in that respect. And uh, surprisingly, we are still able to get, despite the generality of that assumption, are still able to get good bounds. Um, algorithm free and algorithm dependent are slightly more subtle. So it may be that your function uh, can be bounded just because of what the function is um, without knowledge of how it, was, uh, how it was generated. But it may be in some cases that we wish to know uh, more specifically the bound requires us to know how the, uh, uh, how the function was generated, something about the algorithm itself. This would be an algorithm dependent uh, bound as opposed to an algorithm free bound. Here, I think there's no disadvantage to moving to algorithm dependent. There's certainly a chance you might get tighter bounds, um, but the actual you know, knowledge that you get from algorithm free is in some way richer because it can be used to then drive an algorithm. Okay, so we know that if, if this function has this property, it will generalize. Well, okay, well, let's make an algorithm to generate functions that have that property then. Uh, and so, of course, that will not be possible if the bound is algorithm dependent because as soon as we change the algorithm, the bound is no longer valid. Uh, I see there's another question in the chat. Uh, so if x, i, y, i are perfectly i, d sample, the expectation of r, out and r in are uh, the same. Uh, no, that's not the case, uh, because the reason that they're not the same is r out has been, uh, so this is a very good question. So for, if you're do, doing the test band, so that if we have the expectation of this risk and the risk of the error on the, on the test set, those would be identical um, because they are, this is just a sample of this distribution, but for a fixed age. The problem with the training set is that we've chosen H to try to make this look good. You know, we're choosing an H which does well on the training data. So we're biasing our choice of H in favor of this doing well, which is therefore very likely to lead to a mismatch between the true error of H, the expectation of H here, R out, and this empirical error on the training data. Um, there's a question about why we care for lower bounds on the generalization gap. Uh, this is a good question, I think, too. Uh, so they have to add some extra assumptions. So it's the, the probably the classical example of this is the VC. Uh, lower bound, which says that, uh, so there's a characterization of learning in terms of the VC dimension. I'm not going to speak a lot about this, but it basically says that you have a class of functions. There's this uh, property that you can measure known as the VC dimension, and you can use that to provide pack upper bounds on the generalization of any function learned on that class. Um, but you can equally put a lower bound, which says there exist distributions that will force an error that is close to that upper bound. So there's kind of upper and lower bound. But the, the nature of that lower bound is different in that it's saying there exists a distribution, whereas the upper bound, it says, whatever distribution, I will get good performance. And typically what is where learning gets interesting, and even this is true for SVNs, your VC dimension is actually very high or could be even infinite, and yet you still learn. So the lower bound is not kicking in, um, even though you have a lower bound which says you, there are distributions for which you could not learn this class, yet you are able to learn and even able to provide bounds on learning. Uh, this corresponds to actually determining that the distribution is not that worst case distribution, but it's actually a very benign distribution that is making learning much easier than it might be. So think of, I mean, my best intuition about this is the, the, the margin idea, you know, so you have your two classes and there's some nice separation between them, which provides the margin. And so actually it's much easier to classify them than it might have been had they been uh, enmeshed much more and there was no margin. So the margin 
of, uh, say, a support vector machine learning is actually telling you something about the distribution being much nicer than it might be. And therefore, the lower bound is not actually applying in that case. So what I'm saying is the lower bound hopefully will be useless <laughs> because actually it's telling you what might happen in the worst case rather than in a particular instance where you're actually presented with a, a training set, you might be in a much better situation. Is the lower bound basically that in the NFL? No free lunch here. Um, right, sorry, NFL. <laughs> um, you, um, it's, I think it's related in the sense that no free lunch says that whatever method you choose, there will be situations where it will not perform well and you are essentially embedding prior knowledge. The difference, I think, is that in this lower bound, we're saying that there could be a good for, perform. I mean, the no free lunch says, you know, whatever you do, you may be not able to capture the real data that you have. Whereas the lower bound says, actually, the function could be in the class even, but you can't identify it precisely enough with the data, and you are actually, uh, you know, very probably going to pick the wrong function uh, with that amount of data and actually not generalization generalize for that reason, even though the right function is there. So I think it's a, it's different, though related. Okay, I'm gonna power on. Um, so where will so I don't know. Okay. So I hopefully that's set the scene. I'm now gonna do it very, very brief sort of historical or kind of first introduction to, uh, you know, generalization results. Um, and uh, the four pack phase, as it were. So a single hypothesis uh, is really just a test set bound. So we just fix a hypothesis and with high probability, you can say the output, you know, the true error is not going to be much more than the uh, empirical error. Uh, and the factor is this, uh, this is basically Herfding's inequality. Um, and so it, it's, it's very straightforward to prove something of that type, whether this be a classifier or a regressor. Um, now, it's quite easy to build from that, build, that basic building block to uh, a finite function class. So where there are only, we can simply do uh, a union bound over applying this to each of the functions in the class H. So we have to apply this bound, uh, you know, whatever the number of, let's call it NH, the number of functions in H, uh, numbers of times. So by the union bound, in order for the all of these applications to hold with probability one minus delta, each of them has to hold with one minus delta over NH. So we have to you know, tighten the delta by a factor of the number of functions in the class in order to get the total delta, which is coming from a sum of those individual deltas to be less than delta. So this is taking a worst case situation where you're saying, okay, all of these errors that might occur in, in the, in the uh, failure of this inequality for each function are completely independent. And so I have to sum up their probabilities of occurring in order to work out the probability that one of those errors might occur. And so the probability, uh, therefore, the delta has to be divided by NH. So you just substitute delta with delta divided by uh, the number of functions in H, which I'm just denoting with this absolute value of H here. Um, and so that just comes uh, in the top. And so this now holds the probability of uh, the true error less than the empirical error plus this square root of one over two n log of the number of functions in H. Now, this is actually not so bad. It enters benignly under the log, the number of functions, but clearly, you know, that is going to uh, make an effect. Uh, and this is taking no account of any correlations between the functions. And of course, fails if the number of functions 
is uncountable. Um, we can work to uh, countably many functions if we use this approach, uh, which I'm, I'm denoting structural risk minimization. So we think of the hypotheses as uh, indexed by uh, uh, the integers, so H1, H2, uh, and so on. And it could be, a, a, I would say, count of the infinite, the many of them. Um, and we assign a prior weight, PI, to each of these functions. Um, and then we can sort of uh, essentially do what I did before, but now assign the delta uh, to, to function HI, we use the, the, uh, the delta, delta PI, okay? Um, and so by ensuring that the weights sum to less than or equal to one, then we ensure that the sum of the delta pi sums to less than delta. So with probability one minus delta for each hi, this is the bound. And notice now it, the actual bound depends on hi because it depends through this pi. So if we have a higher weight to a function, then its generalization bound will be tighter. So uh, it's kind of a, a slightly uh, confusing, I think, initially, because it feels like, well, obviously, I would choose PI to be highest on the function that I want to learn. But the problem is, because you don't know what that function is, uh, if you did, you wouldn't need to learn it, right? So, so this is uh, kind of the slightly confusing point here, but it, emphasizes the point that we need to choose these weights before we see the data. Um, so we have to choose these weights without, I mean, we can choose them based on prior knowledge of the type of thing we might expect uh, in order to make our bounds tighter, hopefully, uh, but we mustn't make any use of the particular data that we uh, we actually are using in our learning algorithm. Uh, and, and in that way, we get this kind of what I would call function dependent uh, bound. Now, this is actually going to be recurring in the packed phase analysis. We can think of this PI as our prior over the functions. Um, and I'll come back to that when we talk about packed phase. So, so this was countably infinite. Um, what about uncountably infinite function classes? Uh, well, yes, this is really uh, where the real statistical learning theory uh, got going. And uh, VC dimension was, I've already mentioned the back picture of an Enkis dimension was this measure that could characterize learnability of a function class um, and it applies to infinite function classes. Um, Radomacher complexity is a further approach that can be used uh, and uh, provides bounds uh, that are um, uh, workable for, um, let's say, support vector machines as well, can even take into account the margin. Um, so VC dimension, uh, cannot take account of the margin because that requires the real value function. We see the mention is just a discrete value uh, classifier. classifier. Um, so these approaches are suited to analyze the performance of individual functions and take some account of correlations. They must do because they're better than this worst case, uh, you know, treating the functions independently. Um, so these are, you know, very interesting historically in the development of statistical learning theory, um, but I'm actually not going to spend time talking about them. I hope you don't mind, but I thought it would be more useful to move straight to the uh, pack bays um, and discuss that and show you uh, more in more detail about that approach to general, uh, analyzing generalization. Um, so, uh, the pack base is an extension in the sense that it allows us to consider distributions over hypotheses. So rather than have uh, 
a function, uh, sorry, an algorithm pick an individual hypothesis, it can actually pick a distribution. It can also pick an individual hypothesis, but we have to then generate a distribution in order to apply the fact days uh, approach. So I'll talk about how we do that in the case of, say, support vector machines. Um, so this, I think, provides several advantages. Uh, I think one thing it allows us to take into account correlations in a much more sophisticated way between functions, uh, because we're essentially you know, allowing ourselves to include functions that have high correlation as all being somewhat good, you know, maybe with different weightings, but they're all counting in some way. So they're, we're taking into account correlations between functions much more in a much more sophisticated way. And furthermore, it allows us to bring to bear some of the intuitions uh, from Bayesian analysis. And I will talk a bit about the relationship between classical Bayesian learning and this pack Bayes analysis, because there, there are uh, strong similarities, but also significant differences. But I think uh, the connection is that you can bring many very interesting uh, intuitions and insights from the Bayesian analysis into the way in which you apply this pack based approach. Okay, so let's me talk about the pack based framework um, uh, to just set the scene. So uh, in the same way as when we were doing this uh, example here with this prior weight PI, uh, we thought of that could be thought of as a distribution over the functions HI. We have to generate a prior distribution over our functions. Um, and But this could now be obviously an uncountable, fun, uh, uncountable function class. So this is our prior, and we have to fix that distribution before we see the data. Based on the data, uh, so now taking into account the data, we learn a posterior distribution Q over the function class. And we predict by drawing a function according to Q and then predict with that function. So every time we see a test point, we have to draw a function according to Q and use that function. So each time we classify a function, we might get a different result depending on the particular function we drew from the posterior distribution. Uh, so each prediction with a fresh random draw. And the risk measures that we uh, have are just extended from the ones we introduced for uh, the sort of fixed function H uh, by just averaging. So uh, our you know em uh, empirical distribution, which before was just R in of H, the empirical distribution of this function H, is now just averaged over drawing H according to this posterior distribution Q, and the test error is just averaged by averaging that out of sample error, uh, again, according to drawing the function according to Q. Um, so there's a question, do these inequalities always hold? Not sure which inequalities, ah, here. Um, so I guess this is, uh, Gigi, I hope I've got the right, you mean these ones. Uh, they hold with high probability. And so there's a probability that they might not hold. Um, and of course, that you can rank up, that, uh, rack up that probability, but then they these get weaker, the bounds, because the delta grow, sorry, the delta get smaller. Um, but in, in that sense, they are only partially holding, but in every other sense, they hold always. I hope that answers. Um, okay, and the kullback leibler divergence between uh, the posterior and prior distribution is just the expectation um, over uh, functions drawn according to the posterior of log Q over uh, Q of H over Q of H, posterior probability over prior probability. So clearly Q of H must not be uh, non-zero on functions for which P of H is zero, because otherwise this will be infinite. So we have to make Q 
one way of saying that is Q is absolutely continuous with respect to P. So what it says is that P must assign uh, non-zero probability to every function in H. In other words, we, we can think of H as just basically the support of P. Uh, otherwise, we, we mustn't allow Q to give probability to functions for which P did not give probability. Okay, so this is just trying to kind of, sometimes it's good to say what things are and it's sometimes good to say what things aren't. Um, so I'm gonna sort of try to say what the relationship between packed Bayes and generalized Bayes, you know, Bayesian uh, inference is, um, because I think uh, it can be very confusing because we're using the same word and uh, there are many similarities. So I think it's important to, stress what is similar and what isn't similar. Um, and I think uh, these can be uh, you know, actually can be quite interesting to see the connections, but also to see the differences. So uh, in Bayesian analysis, uh, there is a prior and there's a posterior. Um, the prior is in principle has to be correct. Okay, uh, in order for the analysis to be valid. So, but then it's not even quite clear what correct means. Um, and I'm not a Bayesian expert, but so I won't claim you know, that this is a fundamental flaw. Or anything like that. I'm not saying that, but it just, it is, you know, typically what you're doing is making a compromise. You're choosing something that's reasonable. But actually, the analysis is only strictly speaking correct if, if the prior is the correct prior. But then, as I said, there, there's also a question, and it's sort of in some sense a philosophical question, and there's the, what is the correct prior? What does it mean to be the correct prior? Um, is it in some frequentist sense of, you know, if you ran the experiment many, many times, this is the distribution you would experience of uh, functions that you would expect to see uh, solving the problem. But then, you know, how do you run an experiment? It's just, you only have one experiment, you can't run it again and again. So what actually happens is you choose some prior, but strictly speaking, the, as I say, the prior should be correct in some sense in order for the inference to be correct. Then you have some likelihood function that is uh, allowing you to apply Bayes' rule, which updates that distribution to the posterior distribution. So each function has a prior likelihood, and then you factor in the likelihood of the data uh, given that function, uh, if that function is chosen, and that is used to then update that distribution, that probability of that function to the posterior probability, and that gives you the uh, posterior distribution, which is then used to uh, uh, do whatever you, uh, inference you want to. And that is the inference, and then you can use it to make a likelihood estimation, a distribution of possible, say, uh, uh, function value outputs for a particular input, uh, a, a test input, etc. So in packed Bayes, uh, we also have a prior, but as I indicated in the case of the PIs, uh, the validity of the packed Bayes analysis is not dependent on that prior being correct. Uh, so this was the same uh, here where I have that function PI. This is true, however we choose PI, provided we choose it before we see the data. What will change is the tightness of this bound depending on the PI that we chose. So it's, uh, it will depend, if we choose a bad PI, we may get a weaker bound here bad. I mean, with hindsight then, of course, no prior is bad in itself. It's just, you know, we don't know. I and mean, we may choose, uh, you know, a low weight for a function that turns out to be the one that we need. I and mean, that's a bad choice. And that low weight corresponds to a weaker, a bigger, you know, um, generalization gap for that function. And so a weaker bound. Uh, but that's the luck of the draw. You know, you, you, you have to make a choice and live with the consequences. So we have to choose that prior before we see the data, but provided it's chosen without seeing the data, it is valid. 
And it's even possible, I won't talk about this much today, but it's even possible to imagine having a prior that depends on the distribution generating the data. Um, of course, you don't know what that distribution is, but in principle, you can have the prior depend on that distribution and still do some analysis. Uh, but in the cases we'll consider, we'll be dependent, choosing distributions, typically either a priori, maybe simple distributions that we can work with, or even using part of the data to, to do a estimation that can be used to uh, pick a prior and then using the rest of the data to, to train the, pos the posterior distribution. Now, the second point of the back base is that, whereas here in Bayesian inference, there is a unique mapping from prior and data to posterior, in pack base, any distribution can be chosen and it will provide a valid band. But again, you have the freedom to choose this distribution in any way that you, you like. So it's not a unique mapping in that sense. It's not uh, determined by a particular statistical model, but you, you can uh, choose uh, any distribution and therefore optimize that distribution to uh, optimize the band. So the prior is the exploration mechanism of H and the posterior is the twisted prior after confronting the data. And that's true in, in both cases. So uh, just to make uh, those main points again, the plat base bounds hold for any distribution, the base, the prior choice impacts inference, posterior pack base bounds hold for any distribution base, posterior uniquely defined by prior and statistical model understood and data. Um, the data distribution in pack base bounds hold for any distribution. In Bayes, the randomness lies in the noise model generating the output rather than the uh, as we have in the pack phase generation of both inputs and outputs. That's a key difference here that makes it easier to apply Bayesian analysis because you don't require the IID assumption for generating the data. You just need the noise model uh, to be IID. In other words, the noise added to the output must be IID uh, in the Bayesian analysis. Okay. So uh, that's, I think, uh, maybe a good point to take a, a short break uh, because we've gone through all the introductions. I think now I'm going to dig into the generalized pack based theorem. Uh, so probably we need to uh, be fresh <laughs> for that. So uh, if it's okay, I'll just take a 10 minute break and we'll restart at 10 past the hour. Um, so if anyone, you know, feel free to relax. If you have any further questions, do pop them in the, in the uh, chat and uh, I'll try and answer them at the beginning of the next session. Okay, thank you.
Okay, welcome back, everyone. Um, hope you had a good break. So there's a few questions appeared in the chat, which is uh, which is great. Uh, so I'm just going to start by looking at those and then uh, carry on with the with the lecture. So the first question was from Paul Ann Lin. Was if I may, I would like to ask what is the relationship between inductive bias and bounds on the generalization gap. Um, so that's a uh, very close relationship. I mean, essentially inductive bias is where you are in some way imposing a restriction on your functions. Uh, so you've got some bias built into your function class. And uh, by doing that, you're likely to reduce the generalization gap. Um, however, I mean, I would perhaps stress that that kind of very simplistic relationship may not always hold in the sense that we might expect, in that, you know, if you think about, let's say, support vector machines, um, there is an inductive bias by the choice of kernel that actually puts a, a you know, a prior distribution effectively, if you think of it from a Bayesian point of view, over the functions. However, um, it is fair to say that we are able to learn in a way that does better than that, you know, the generalization gap that might, might afford if uh, we're looking at data with a, say, a large margin. So in that sense, there is a kind of uh, a way of almost cheating <laughs> the inductive uh, bias that we seem to be imposing and, and doing, you know, or lack of inductive bias that we seem to be imposing. Um, and yet doing well with generalization. But there is a very close relationship. So the second question was, is learning only to be able to generalize? What if the predictor performs terrible, terribly on an in-sample data as well as that on an out-of-sample data? Uh, this is Chi Chihun with Chen. Um, so yeah, I mean, when I say generalize, I mean actually the performance on the test data. So what you're talking about here is the gap. And of course, the generalization bounds are the gap. But implicit in that is how flexible can we keep our function class while keeping the gap small? If you see what I mean. That, uh, in other words, what we want is a, a flexible function class where we can still do well on the training data, but not pay the price of having, you know, a very large gap because we've got such a, a flexible function class. And that comes back to the point I was just making, which is, are there ways we can somehow, you know, say the gap in this case is less than we might have expected, you know, as in the large margin example, uh, because actually, although we've got this very flexible function class, we've identified that this particular function is easier to learn uh, than might be expected uh, from, you know, uh, uh, more general functions. So. Uh, so definitely, it's it's not just to bound the gap; it's to bound the gap plus the performance on the training data that we're interested in doing, and that does, as you, you know, rightly suggest, indicate a trade-off that we need to make. Uh, I hope that's uh, a clear answer. And then uh, Armando Lewis asks: Is the choice of distribution always arbitrary with pack days, or would there be some theory given or heuristic support? Um, Again, great question. Of course, we <clears throat> we want to build into that uh, prior distribution our um, our um, knowledge, prior knowledge that we have about the particular learning scenario, um, and that prior knowledge. I mean, as I already said, a support vector machine. We build in prior knowledge through the choice of kernel. And we can think of that very much in the way of a Bayesian prior. Um, and that's exactly what we'll be doing with support vector machines when I show that in, in, in the next section of the, of the tutorial. Effectively, we're going to build in that prior, you know, the Bayesian prior, the standard Bayesian prior uh, as our initial choice. Um, then, you know, as I mentioned, we could use part of the training data to perhaps improve that, but provided we don't use that data then to evaluate the bound we're okay because uh, we've kind of, you know, the data we used to reserve the band was seen after the data was, that was used to generate the prior. So we're okay, the, 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 
rule is you mustn't use the data that you use to evaluate the band to choose the prior. Other data you can. Um, but also there may be, you know, you may have prior knowledge in the form of maybe some, maybe you're modeling some physical environment where you have some approximate uh, physical models that may not be exact, you know, maybe it's, um, you know, some fluid process, you know, maybe you're trying to model the weather or something, you have some approximate um, physical models, Navier-Stokes equation or whatever it might be. And you may be able to build in a prior based on those equations, but adding in, of course, the randomness that you aren't able to model with the, with the physical equations. And that will give you a much more refined prior than you would get from a, just a blank, you know, Gaussian distribution in parameter space. So, you know, there, there definitely are uh, things that can be done depending on the particular application and knowledge you have that you can bring to the table for that particular application. Um, and then Yu Chun Lai has asked, what is the relationship between Bayesian inference and PAC phase? Are they the, uh, independent? I think it's fair to say that they're not fully independent in the sense that PAC phase is very much inspired. Um, but the relationship is, uh, you know, kind of can be confusing because in some ways things that you know, for example, the, I don't know, the fact that we can choose the posterior in any way we want seems very strange to a Bayesian, although, you know, you could think of approximate Bayesian inference as doing something like that. So there are, again, relationships. And it's, it's really a, you know, we have to think of it from a pack Bayes point of view. What we have and what I'm going to show you is a bound on the generalization that depends on these moving parts, the prior, the posterior, and a few other things. It just happens that that happens to be very aligned with the analysis that Bayesian inference does, but they're actually motivated and the bounds they give are entirely different. So it's kind of a parallel. I mean, it's a bit like doing, you know, Gaussian processes and port vector machines or, you know, retrogression or whatever you want to call it. You know, it's it's actually the same algorithm, but um, it's uh, it's motivated in a different way. And you know, where wherefore, you know, a Bayesian, the kernel is, uh, you know, defining the prior distribution, the covariance function. Um, for the kernel person, this is defining a feature space, and you're doing linear functions in that feature space. Uh, so they're completely different ways of viewing the same thing. Uh, but, uh, you know, they, they, sorry, but they end up actually being uh, identical algorithms. So in some sense, they're parallels, but not entirely parallels. And I think they provide different perspectives and each can be very illuminating to the other, I believe. Uh, so I think it's a very interesting, you know, kind of almost like two views of the same thing. Uh, so then Hippolyte has asked, here we have a prior on a random process. Even if we have nice bounds, we don't know how tight, how well we perform. We will also have to simulate the posterior, which could be difficult. So will we do better by building confidence intervals than if we use the usual sampling schemes to generate a sample of learners by a cross validation bootstrap, for which we already know the theoretical policies of the risks. I'm not sure if I agree that we know the properties of the risks, but uh, you know, I'm never going to say that heuristic methods aren't useful. I think the theory methods are, um, can do two things. I mean, they can provide uh, bounds that are provably hold, okay, with high probability, but effectively we guarantee they hold. So we're actually saying something with, you know, high confidence, um, and they can drive new algorithms potentially. Um, so I, I certainly don't want to say that in many cases, you know, in, in practical cases, you won't want to do cross-validation, bootstrap, etc., uh, because those will be uh, possibly the only methods that are available to you. But nonetheless, I think if you can do theoretical bank, they can, and I hope I'll demonstrate that by the end of the tutorial, they can be very useful. Um, the questions keep coming, this is amazing. Okay. Uh, I, and apologies if I'm not answering them fully. Um, so Andrea, again, it seems that this bound holds for any Q 
So why should we learn Q based on data to reduce the KL term? Okay, very good question, Andrea. So uh, yeah, essentially this band holds for all Q that you're looking at. I mean, I'll discuss in more detail how it's applied, but essentially from a practical point of view, we can, as, as Andrea said, we choose Q however we want, but what we're interested in is optimizing this thing, right? The bound on the outer sample performance. And that is affected by two, uh, in two ways uh, by Q. One is the KL term uh, that you refer to. Um, and the second is through this in sample uh, empirical error term, R in of Q. So as we make Q close to the prior, this term gets small but this probably will be big. The prior will probably not be uh, giving good performance on the training data. So what we're, the tension that this band is suggesting we must do or, or, or must you know, balance is we need to move Q to be better on the training data. So to, to reduce this empirical error term here, R in of Q, uh, because that's gonna make, I mean, essentially, you know, this delta is saying, uh, these things must be close. How close is determined by this term here. So by making this small, there's a chance we can guarantee our out will be small, but we need to have this term small as well. And that means we need to make Q not too far from P. So the tension is to move Q, uh, keep Q as close to P while making the empirical error as small as possible. Um, and finally, uh, Peng Yu, Liu, are there any methods to measure the tightness of the bands? Um, well, I, I, yeah, I mean, I guess theoretically not. I mean, because if you had a, a way of measuring how tight they are, you could make them tighter. Um, but I mean, obviously empirically, you can run, you know, run tests on data and see how tight the bands are compared to the test error on a test set. Um, um, is there any particular property Olav owning of KL that is used in the in the theorem, <clears throat> or could we substitute with any F divergence? Yes, you could substitute with any F divergence. I mean, um, yeah. I'll, um, no, sorry. Uh, I have to be careful what I say here. Um, there's two way. Yeah. So there's this delta can be any. Uh, convex uh, function. Um, no, I'm not. I'm not sure. I, I have. Uh, Ola, I'm sorry. I'm not sure. I have an answer to that question. I think it has to be certainly in the way we we will prove it today. It will have to be the KL. Yeah, but I think it can be generalized. Uh, but I'm not 100% sure. Very well. Okay. Um, so let me uh, continue. Okay, so um, we start with a convex function, which actually we will in many of the applications, uh, well, some applications, we will use a KL between um, binomial distributions. So we'll look at that a little later, but for the time being, just consider this as a function from the interval zero one times interval zero one to the reals which is convex in both, uh, in both arguments. Um, so the general theorem says that this, if we apply this uh, delta function to the uh, difference between the, sorry, to the empirical and the true error of our Q posterior distribution, then that is bounded by one on M of the KL divergence between Q and P, log this I delta M term divided by delta. Delta is again our confidence and you know, our probability of being misled is delta. So the probability one minus delta this holds. It holds for all posterior distributions. Um, and this I delta of M term is uh, something that will end up as being a, uh, a modest function of M in, in the kind of applications we, we're looking at. Um, but it actually has this form, it's the soup over R in uh, the interval zero one of this binomial uh, term times E to the M 
delta, the same delta that was used here, of k over m uh, on the r. We'll see how this arises. This isn't very informative, I have to admit, but perhaps when you see how it arises, uh, it will make more sense. Okay, so I'm not going to go through every detail of the proof, but I am going to give you a little bit of a um, uh, kind of indication of the key ideas. And the first key idea of this change of measure inequality. Um, so if we take any measurable function from H to the, the, the reals, uh, and in our case, we're going to be thinking of this function, M delta K over M, uh, sorry, the empirical error and the uh, true error um, of H. So think of this as just some function of h, which maps the real. So take the, uh, and this is like the uh, moment generating function for the distribution uh, uh, with h according to the prior. So this is for the prior distribution here and minus log of that. Um, now we can introduce, uh, change this, and this is the change of measure to be a distribution over q uh, if we introduce the fraction P of H over Q of H here. And then uh, we can move the log through the expectation by Jensen's inequality, or sorry, the minus log. Uh, so we get the expectation over Q log, and because of the minus, the swap is Q of H over P of H, and uh, the um, log of E to the phi is just uh, phi of H, so the expectation of H of Q of phi of H. Um, and this is just the KL divergence of Q with respect to P minus the expectation of Q. So this is a key change of measure when, and it makes clear where this KL term comes from. Um, Markov's inequality, uh, fairly standard. So if we have an expectation, uh, sorry, the probability that uh, a random variable, which is a positive random variable, uh, is greater than some uh, value A is less than or equal to its expectation uh, divided by A. And so the probability that X is less than or equal to its expectation divided by delta is greater than or equal to one minus delta. So we're going to make use of that at one point. Very uh, basic inequality. Um, so there's this probability observing K misclassification. So I'm specializing for classification. Um, Perhaps I could have done this later and it would have been perhaps clearer, but uh, uh, hopefully it will be clear where you need to change things if you want to go for, say, regression or something uh, other than classification. So uh, given a voter H, consider a binomial variable which uh, of M trials with success probability R out of H. So this is the true error of H. And uh, so we're generating, like this is my real test uh, data, probability that uh, the empirical error is equal to k over m is m choose k, the probability to make k errors, and you make uh, uh, k, uh, m minus k that are not errors, and we're calling this binomial k m or out of h. Okay, so now we're going to put everything together and prove this uh, result. So we start with this uh, thing that we're interested in here. Um, uh, but with the expectation inside, uh, so we explicitly include the expectation. So this is this quantity here, right? Uh, but we've taken out, remember that R in of Q is actually the uh, expectation over H drawn of according to Q of R in of H and so on, okay? Uh, by Jensen's inequality, we can move, remember this is a convex function, so we can move the expectation outside and we have the expectation of M delta R in of H R out of H. Uh, we now apply our change of measure inequality, um, but applied the other way, I'll just go quickly back to that. So we, we're effectively starting from this quantity here with phi of H being that M delta uh, R in of H R out of H, um, and that's going to be uh, less than or equal to KL uh, plus this, this thing, so it's swapped around. Um, uh, so KL plus this log E uh, expectation over the prior of E to the M delta R in of H R out of H. 
Uh, and this is the thing that we're going to, you know, analyze in a particular case of uh, regression, but you would need to actually analyze differently if you were doing a uh, regressor or other types of uh, problems. So applying Markov's inequality to this thing here, this is less than or equal to, so this is a, a particular value for a particular sample, which we've got the R in here, the empirical estimate. So we're now going to take an expectation over that sample. Um, and the expectation by Markov's inequality, this is less than or equal to one over delta times its expectation. So that's that. We then swap these expectations. Um, and uh, we then apply, because now uh, we have uh, this is the probability expectation of this value, we can think about it in terms of how probable, and it depends on this R in of H, we can just divide it up according to the different values that R in of H could take. And they could be anywhere, this is just the number of, you know, this is an empirical error, which could be zero over M to M over M. We could make zero errors up to M errors, and in general, K errors. So we sum K equals zero up to M. The probability of making K errors is this, that's just the binomial expression before. And then we have this uh, quantity here with now K over M fixed. And uh, then because we now have to take the expectation over the prior, we just take the soup of uh, the only way the prior enters here is through this uh, um, out uh, true error. Uh, sorry, I mean, uh, sorry, through H, right? Uh, if the prior is choosing H. But if we think about this as just well, the only way that's affecting this is through this probability of error. So let's just call that R and then just take the soup over the value that R could take will be anywhere between zero and one. And that is the definition of I delta N that uh, I gave on the first page. Uh, yeah, so that's I delta N. And so we are actually at the end of the proof. So hopefully I've given you the key components. I think the two take homes are that it's not that complicated. Hopefully um, you would agree. I mean, there. Uh, each step is, is, is reasonable. It's quite, I mean, I think it's quite intuitive what's happening in terms of the change of measure. Uh, it's very nice. And what we're effectively doing is bounding some moment generating function as a critical component. And uh, this uh, is the critical thing we need to do in order to apply the bound. So the bound is true in general. And in fact, we haven't even used the IID property yet. Um, in deriving this bound. So this bound is very generally true. The critical question is how do we actually bound uh, this quantity, I delta of M, or in more general cases, before we move to the bi uh, binary uh, example, how we would uh, bound this quantity here, which we can think of as sort of generalized uh, moment generating function. Um, so that's... Uh, that's the uh, the critical question, or indeed, if it is bound, you know, we need to find a bound for it. It may not be bounded in, in, in another case. Okay, so I'm going to now list a few corollaries, which will be created by substituting in different deltas and uh, um, making a different application. So the first one is the the, the classification bound for SVNs, let's say, or for, for which uh, was generally um, Langford and Seeger are given the uh, citation for this. Um, so the choice of delta here is this, uh, I mentioned earlier, is this KL divergence between two binomial distributions. So we think of the uh, empirical error as Q, uh, a number, but think of it actually as the probability of making an error on in, in the empirical, uh, and P is the probability of making an error in the um, out of sample. But now think of these as 
both as distributions over zero and one. One if you make an error, zero if you don't. So this is actually a distribution Q and one minus Q, and this is a distribution P and one minus P, and then this is the KL divergence between those two distributions. So this is the KL between the two binomial distributions, uh, one defined by Q and the other defined by P. Um, and if we apply that, then all we needed to do was to bound this quantity for that particular choice of delta. Um, and I will do that on the next slide, but it turns out you can bound it by two mu tau. Okay, so that is the bound. Um, note that log of two root n is, is very small when we're dividing by one over here. So this is not a, a very expensive term. The big expensive terms this one. Um, another choice is to upper bound that, uh, sorry, lower bound that by two times q minus p squared. That's a very uh, you know, simple lower bound of the KL between those two. And if we do that, we get the McAllister bound with the uh, R out less than or equal to R in Q square root of one over two M. Uh, and this. These look very similar. And for large error rates, you know, the order of points uh, two, let's say these two are quite comparable, but for low error rates, you know, point, uh, point 0.1 or point 0 0.05 or something like that, point zero two. Uh, error rates, this is much tighter, this one here. Um, <clears throat> another choice of the delta function is this delta C function um, defined in this way. This is due to Olivier Catoni, who is one of the pioneers of, of act phase analysis. Um, and uh, uh, this results in the following bound, which again has more of this flavor to it than this one, there's no square root, but there's an extra C in front of the, um, I'm sorry, C over one minus e to the minus C, um, which is this, depends on this choice of C here. So you've got a, a choice here, obviously, in this case, you have to choose the C once and for all because uh, you're deriving the bound with that C. So if you apply, try different values of C, you'll have to uh, take that into account by, uh, do, you know, doing a union bound uh, with smaller values of delta. Um, in this case, the I delta N term turns out to be one. Um, so it's a particularly small, you know, easy value. Um, but uh, this is you know, a kind of compromise perhaps between these two. Um, and Alquia et al also had a bound based using this lambda over N, E minus Q, and again, here we get something more like uh, this flavor in terms of R out less than equal to R in, but there's a one on lambda rather than the square root uh, in this. Uh, and there should be, uh, I think, hmm. I hope that's correct. I'm not sure whether there shouldn't be a one on N, but maybe lambda is taken to be. Yeah, sorry, I'm not quite clear about that, but anyway, this is the form uh, that uh, I think it takes. Okay, so here's just, uh, I, I mentioned I would uh, uh, demonstrate how this 2 root m is uh, derived. Uh, so let's just quickly do that. Uh, so this is the thing we want to bound, if you remember. Um, uh, and essentially we're doing it through this binomial function. Um, and uh, the first observation is that we can write this as, uh, because it's E to the M delta, remember this was now the KL between the binomial distributions. And as we're taking its exponential, we've actually got RS of H over RH times M to the RS of H. I mean, sorry, this is just this quantity, taking this, the exponential of this, you get the uh, exponential log, you get Q over P to the power Q, um, which is RS over R to the power RS of H, one minus RS of H, one minus RH, the R, one minus RS of H, and the M comes from here. Um, we then do this binomial trick 
but the nice property is that the binomial actually depends on um, RH. And so we actually get the RH is the probability RS of H equals K over N uh, gives us RH to the K, one minus RH to the N minus K. And so these nicely cancel and we end up with this expression some k equals one uh, zero up to n of m choose k k over m to the k one minus k over m to the n minus k. Now that's might be tempted to think it's just a binomial expansion. It's not because the uh, um, the k in, is involved here as well as here and here. Uh, but if you use um, Sterling's uh, expression for the exponential, uh, sorry for the um, yeah, for the exponential, you can uh, actually derive this bound. This was due to uh, um, anyway. Uh, it's a it's a nice bound. So this comes out to be two B ten. Um, so in the proof, I just said this is probability is replaced by the probability mass function of the binomial. Um, now this is where we have made the assumption that the examples are drawn IID. We made that in this binomial expansion, i.e. s is equal to d. So it's actually inbound in this i delta m function that we make that assumption. Um, so the result would not be validated. It's non-ID, even if the general theorem is. Okay, so I'm now going to uh, move to applying this to uh, support vector machines. Uh, so linear functions, I'm actually thinking, so working in the feature space uh, of this four vector machine. Um, and we're going to choose the prior and posterior distributions to be Gaussians with unit variance. So this is a very simplistic choice that actually turns out to give surprisingly tight uh, bounds. So the prior will be centered at the origin uh, with unit variance and the center of the posterior will be in the direction of the spore vector machine or the, the function of weight, um, but scaled by a factor mu. Okay? Um, so here's the prior based at the origin, and here's the weight vector direction for the say, support vector machine. Uh, and then we simply scale, uh, take a distance in that direction. Maybe w is the unit vector, mu is the distance, and we put a posterior distribution at that uh, point, okay? So as I said, you know, these are just particular choices. It's clear the prior doesn't depend on the data. Uh, the posterior does, it's a particular choice. Um, and so if we look at the band, um, let's look at the components in the band. So this is uh, this KL between the empirical and the true error. Uh, this is the KL between prior and posterior. Uh, this is a slightly weaker version. It was two root n. Uh, n plus one is a fairly bigger than that. And this, before the tighter band was derived, this was the one that was typically used. So this should be two root n here, uh, slightly tighter derived by n. So q delta uh, uh, w u is the true performance of the stochastic classifier. Remember, stochastically, we draw uh, a weight according to the posterior distribution and use that. Uh, to do the classification. Uh, however, the SVM is a deterministic classifier. We'd like to know the bound on that. Um, but uh, it exactly corresponds to taking the sign of the expectation of the classification with respect to the posterior. So if more of the posterior is saying positive than negative, then the center of the distribution will say positive. So the classifier, the deterministic classifier, which is at the center of the distribution, will say uh, positive classification. And so if the sign of this will actually uh, give the same classification as the SVM. And so its error bound is bounded by twice the stochastic classifier, uh, since if an uh, uh, X is misclassified, at least half of the random classifiers, uh, so if the center is misclassified, that means that the at least half of the random uh, classifications will make an error. So we can bound the error of the 
the deterministic classifier by twice the error of the stochastic. So we have a bound on this stochastic classifier and our error for the um, deterministic one that we're typically going to use will be uh, twice that. Um, so now, uh, so that's uh, just taking a look at that, uh, that term there. Now this is the empirical uh, stochastic error. Uh, remember, so we need to uh, try to, we need to compute this in order to apply the bound. And it turns out it's actually, it can be computed in what is effectively closed form. So it's the expectation of this function f tilde of mu gamma of x, y, where gamma is the margin uh, or the normalized margin. So it's the um, y times the classification. So it will be positive if it's correctly classified, divided by the norm of the input and the norm of the weight vector. Um, and this uh, f tilde function is the uh, one minus the cumulative normal distribution. <clears throat> so it sort of makes sense intuitively because the posterior distribution is normal. So the you know, probabilities of uh, misclassifying will uh, satisfy um, a cumulative or one minus in this case, cumulative normal distribution. So they can, this can be computed very simply. So we get the empirical uh, stochastic error term which we need in order to compute this bound. Uh, this KL is again very simple because the Gaussian is centered at the origin. Q is a uh, distance mu from the origin. So the KL and they both have the same covariance structure. So the, uh, uh, the KL term is just mu squared divided by two. Delta is the confidence. So it holds the probability one minus delta over the randomized section of the data. Um, and so uh, since the bound holds for all posterior distributions, we can choose mu, remember mu is this scaling parameter here um, that scales the weight vector. We can choose it to optimize the bound. Uh, and so if we define the inverse of the KL to be uh, this small KL, uh, Q comma A, uh, to be the max of the true error that's consistent with the inequality that the KL of Q B is less than or equal to A, then we have with probability one minus delta that the probability of misclassification of the deterministic SVM is less than or equal to twice, that was the two coming from the conversion from stochastic to deterministic, the minimum over mu of this KL of the minus one of the, this is this empirical, uh, you know, cumulative Gaussian uh, estimation of the empirical error, and this is mu squared over two log and this one of the delta. Uh, so you can think of that as giving you a motivation for the SVM optimization that I'm sure you're all familiar with. Uh, I won't dwell on it. Mm. But essentially what you're trying to do is minimize the norm of the weight vector subject to maximizing the margin. Um, and so that's exactly, you know, these psi i's are sort of measuring the margin and you're minimizing the norm vector while minimizing the margin loss. Um, and what you've effectively done is replace this cum one minus the cumulative Gaussian by a hinge loss in order to make the thing convex. You could see that as a way of motivating the support vector machine if you wanted. Um, so this was, uh, I'll now show you a few more of those plots, uh, like the one I showed you at the very beginning, that distribution of errors. Uh, so this is to show how by actually using the support vector machine that is motivated, motivated to optimize this uh, uh, distribution, uh, the, the, the uh, tail error attained by the tail of the distribution, as opposed to perhaps a you know, more simplistic classifier like the plasma window, uh, which simply takes an average of the positives uh, and subtracts it from that the average of the negative examples in the training set and uses that with a threshold set of, uh, halfway between those two uh, vectors. Uh, so very simplistic, but on average, not so bad. Um, we use then the, this is our, uh, what we're calling our generalization 
which is the expectation of the loss of the function we've learned on a randomly drawn test point. And we plot this histogram of errors that we change when we draw a, a number of random uh, training sets. Um, and uh, these are the sizes that I've chosen just to show how the uh, performance de deteriorates with the different with the two algorithms. Um, so just a note to say that the expected classifier for the um, house and window is actually always the same uh, because it's the expected value uh, of the positives minus expected values of the negatives. And that's just the expected value of the positive example minus the expected value of the negative example. So we don't expect large differences in the average of the distribution, but the nonlinearity of the loss function means they won't be the same. So this is, if you just use the full data set, your error is about 0.15, something like that. Um, so that's that's you know training error here because I'm just using the full data set. So now if we move to uh, data size 205, you can see the support vector machine is consistently doing better, but most importantly, it's avoiding this tail of the distribution, which the files and window exhibits, where the errors get a lot worse. Um, while the means are actually not that different, the, uh, the chances are much higher of making quite bad errors with the files and window compared to the support vector machine. Um, and this pattern repeats as we reduce the size of the data set to now just 137 training examples. You know, we're still keeping uh, you know, a very tight control on the error with the support vector machine um, compared to say the mean, but the bars and window is allowing quite high errors to occur. Um, and as we reduce this pattern, uh, is even more evident as you get really quite high errors with the class and window. Um, uh, size 20, things are beginning to deteriorate badly, but there's still clearly much more chance of high error with the uh, class and window uh, as we go to this very sort of core problem um, that I've done at that point. Um, <clears throat> now, that was all just linear functions in the input space. But of course, with four vector machines, you can use the kernel trick and actually move to an infinite dimensional feature space by using the Gaussian kernel. Um, and uh, to do that, it can, you know, nonetheless, despite giving it all that flexibility, it controls it. And we're able to, you know, get a very consistent uh, distribution of errors uh, over, um, you know, random, samplings of the training data. Uh, okay, there's a question here. What does the y-axis mean? Uh, y-axis is, sorry, this, these are histograms. Um, so this is uh, the frequency of different bins. I've just put them in different bins. I think there were a thousand random um, samples, training sets generated. And uh, we were just uh, binning the frequency of, uh, you know, training sets landing in different bins. And this was the, the distribution of that. Uh, so it's sort of just a probability density really of the probability of having a training set for which the test error was whatever it might have been, 0 0.1, 0 0.15, 0 0.14, 0 0.13, et cetera. Sorry, if that wasn't clear. But these are all, so here we've even got some, you know, errors worse than 0.5 or, um, or some of the training sets showing how badly things can go wrong. Um, but the support vector machine is mostly controlling things. So if we ignore the worst case with high probability, we could probably say that the bound on the error is about 0.35, uh, uh, which is you know, significantly better than you can passing window. And even if you reduce the training set size to 273, it's still able to control the flexibility of the, uh, the high dimensional <coughs> features. Okay. Um, I'm going to keep going. Uh, I'll take another short break in a moment, but I think I'll, I'll talk. Uh, well, actually, maybe now is a good moment. Um, okay. So hopefully that's, yeah, it's a good moment to take a short break. Maybe we'll just take a uh, six minute break now. 
uh, just to kind of refresh, and then I'll go into this idea of learning the prior, uh, which I think is quite informative and leads into some of the work we uh, I'll talk about for deep networks towards the end of the tutorial. Okay, so if we can reconvene on the hour, uh, sorry, it's five minutes now, on the hour, uh, we'll carry on at that point. Thank you.
Okay, uh, welcome back everyone. We had a chance for a quick break. Um, okay, so moving on, um, I've just covered off the application, the base application to support vector machines through the use of uh, simple Gaussian distributions. Um, what I want to move to now, uh, which will lead the way into the uh, application to deep learning, is this question of how we can define priors in a more careful way. Um, so an important component in the pack based analysis is the choice of the prior distribution. Um, but, uh, and, uh, you know, as I indicated, the results hold whatever the choice of prior, provided that it is chosen before seeing the data sample or without reference to the data sample. Um, so are there ways we can choose a better prior? Um, so I think uh, we're mainly going to focus on this idea of using part of the data to learn the prior, um, uh, both for SVMs and, and more generally for deep learning. Um, but there is also the possibility that I mentioned in the title, which is this idea of defining the prior in terms of the data generating distribution, which I'm not going to cover off, but uh, that's an interesting one that's been considered originally by Olivier Catoni that I mentioned, uh, but uh, it's a uh, very kind of tantalizing idea, certainly something that would be difficult to imagine from you know, a Bayesian perspective, Bayesian analysis, but uh, so far it's not actually borne uh, very successful fruit in terms of the tightness of bounds. Okay, so, um, the bounds depend on the distance between prior and posterior distribution. So if we could get a better prior closer to posterior, we should get a better bound. So the idea um, that basically we'll be exploring is this idea of learning the prior with part of the data and then introduce the learned prior in the bound and then compute the stochastic error with the remaining data. Okay, so this is just to make very clear the various components. I'm just going to do a diagram. So the idea is we learn a weight vector WR. Um, I'm illustrating this for the SVM, but this could be a deep network as well. Um, so here's our weight vector for the SVM, we learn for the subset of the data. Um, we then choose a prior, which is some distance in that direction. Um, and then we learn a posterior distribution. Now that could be learned with all the data or just with the data that was not used to learn the prior, doesn't matter. Um, because remember, any posterior is good. Um, so how we learn this posterior doesn't matter. We can use all the data. Um, this should be eta, by the way, this was a mistake. Mu is the scaling of the posterior, eta is the scaling of the prior. Um, so now we would have the distance between prior and posterior be here which could be potentially quite a lot less than the distance between the uh, previous prior, which was set at the origin and the posterior. Um, so if we write down these uh, uh, expressions, here's the true performance of the classifier, it's the same the empirical error is the same, except that it's now evaluated only on the points that were not used to train the prior distribution, okay? Um, this now is the new KL divergence, which is hopefully smaller because it now involves the distance between the posterior and this prior vector rather than just the norm of the posterior. Um, and uh, this now we're dividing by a smaller amount because we're only having M minus R, where R was the number of data points used to train the prior, M minus R points involved in the evaluation of the bound as the points that weren't involved in training the prior. Um, and uh, so this penalty term only depends on the remaining data. Um, and we could in envisage a classifier that optimizes this bound and uh, we're calling it the PSVM, which essentially uh, you know, treats the prior as the, if you like, thing we regularize against uh, rather than the origin, which would be the normal SVM. Uh, but in other ways, it's unchanged. Uh, but again, there will be now only optimizing these quantities based on the, on the, um, uh, the non prime data. Um, and uh, so the bound for the PSVM, exactly, we solve the PSVM. And because, again, it's, it's the bound driving an algorithm here, 
um, we compute these large in quantities and we do a linear search over the optimal value of mu. Um, there is actually a way of, I mean, the other thing we have to do here is choose the length of the prior. So I'm sorry, I'm just going back here, this quantity eta here, eta w r. r. And because this has to be chosen before the data, we can't choose eta to optimize the band. We have to choose eta before. Uh, so potentially we have to take a discrete set of values of eta and uh, you know, uh, do a union bound over all of those uh, choices in, and apply the bound for each choice separately. Uh, however, there is a way we can possibly do better and that is to elongate the prior. So rather than make it spherical, we elongate it in the direction of WR, a bit like a rugby ball. Um, and then there'll be less cost of, it doesn't matter where we choose the length of the posterior, there'll be less cost for moving from that prior. And uh, there's a bound here that we get if we do that. Um, this is the rugby ball prior where the cost is divided between uh, the perpendicular uh, distance to the, um, uh, to the prior, uh, which we pay a full penalty for, and this parallel distance to the prior where we pay a factored penalty tau, factored by tau, which is this elongation factor. So by making tau quite large, uh, we can reduce this, at the cost of this log tau squared here, which is very benign. Uh, this is tau to the minus two anyway, so that's small. So by making tau large, we can actually trade off between these two uh, in a way that we can do without having to apply uh, a uh, union bound. Uh, and there's even a, a new SVM that optimized the eta power prior um, by just saying we're going to allow uh, any uh, uh, multiplication, any uh, multiplication of the prior vector, and we only cost the perpendicular vector in the SVM, and we can also solve that. So just to show how these things stack up, I'm going to very briefly show some simple results in a few data sets. Um, compare with using this various bands to do model selection and to compare the test performance against tenfold cross-validation uh, and also to show how tight the bands are in different cases. Um, so on UCI datasets, and we're gonna use uh, the model selection to choose the value of the regularization parameter C and the kernel width of a Gaussian kernel. Um, so uh, that's uh, the factor. Um, and either using tenfold cross validation or these fact phase bounds or the prior fact phase bounds to select the tail in and the band. So here's the results. Um, and I think it's, you know, there's a few things that are worth mentioning. Um, so this is the test error, TE for test error. These are different data sets. This is twofold cross validation or tenfold cross validation. And so the test error is 0 0.007 in this case. Um, uh, the test error for doing model selection with the pack bound, uh, uh, sorry, pack base bound, the simple pack base bound is 0 0.007, so it matches cross validation. Um, for the other methods, it, for the tighter bounds, uh, it actually does slightly worse in this case, uh, but note that the bounds are much tighter. So ironically, we get better bounds, but worse model selection it appears. Um, so here, the, you know, the bound is 0.175, which is uh, relatively weaker, but here it's 0.107 or 0.05. So, you know, these are a factor of five, uh, something of that kind, four or five, which is, you know, pretty, pretty good, I think. Um, we'll see some even tighter bounds for, for um, deep networks. But uh, so in many cases, even the pack bound 
model selection does better than cross-validation in this case and in this case, and in this case really quite significantly better, um, even though the bounds in this case are, well, no, they're, they're fine. Thank you. Um, I think the pattern tends to confirm what we saw in the first case, that the bounds get tighter with the, um, with the uh, more complex methods, you know, this eta prior SVM giving very tight, much tighter bounds, but actually worse model selection. Uh, and this is most, though in this case, it actually does both get tighter bounds, much tighter bounds, and do better model selection uh, comparing with uh, the cross validation. So overall, I say the, uh, if you average the test error over all of these classifiers, the best model selection is done by the fact phase bound, 0 0.081. Um, uh, but then it's the cross validations. Uh, sorry, no, these, these even do better than cross validation on average. Uh, but that's mainly because of this one year where there are very significantly better uh, bounds of God. Anyway, overall the message is that it, it's, I think it's fair to say that the bounds are remarkably tight. Um, and uh, uh, the factor between test between bound and test error is under three uh, on average. Um, model selection for the bounds is as good as test temporal cross validation, um, and in some cases gives better. Um, the better bounds don't appear to give better model selection. Um, uh, so anyway, I, I think it, you know it looks. You know, particularly, you know, when I started out in statistical learning theory, the bounds were, you know, <clears throat> orders of magnitude worse, and, and they were really very much just theoretical. Here, you're actually getting something that could be meaningful in practice, I think. So I'm now going to turn to the deep learning generalization, um, and uh, hopefully show that some of these ideas uh, carry across to deep learning and, and can be applied. Uh, I think there are many unanswered questions, but nonetheless, it's, 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 it's very encouraging, I think, the results that we're seeing. So uh, sort of general comment, deep learning achieves remarkable success results with very complex models. So it would appear at first sight, and often people quote this as contradicting many of the precepts of statistical learning theory. Um, and the question arises, can fact phase give non-trivial bounds for such models? Um, I think I would argue, you know, I, I completely agree with all that, but I don't think this is so new as people would appear because support vector machines are also uh, with, a, with a, you know, say a Gaussian kernel are very rich models, which again, allow, you know, quite uh, flexible classification. And yet we are, you know, uh, for many years now, able to get good bounds for support vector machines. So it's not strictly the case that we don't have bounds for complex models. However, I think it's fair to say that, you know, deep learning architectures are an order of magnitude more, or two orders of magnitude or three more complex than uh, some of the types of uh, models that were based with, you know, kernels for support vector machines. So um, what we're going to consider is generating distributions over weights. <clears throat> so we're going to have, it's going to be very similar in the sense to what we were doing with the support vector machine. You know, we're having a, a distribution over weights, uh, but we're going to allow each weight to have its own standard deviation. So there will be much, you know, whereas in the case of the support vector machines, we were having spherical Gaussians. Here we're going to have independent Gaussian distributions for each weight. The prior will either be centered around a random initialization or learned as we did in the support vector case from part of the data. And then we'll train the posterior distribution by using loss functions that reflect the pack phase bound. Uh, so what we're trying to do is optimize the posterior distribution by gradient descent. 
Uh, so it's a very natural thing to do in the context of deep learning. Um, so rather than doing some, you know, normal stochastic gradient descent on the weight vector, we're doing this on effectively a posterior distribution, <coughs> but you know, very similar uh, approach. And we're using uh, four flavors of the training. Um, F classic. Uh, I should say that this is original uh, work doing this was by Gigate and uh, uh, Roy. Um, I think they looked at these F classic and F lambda, and possibly F BBB. And we, we've been looking at adding this F quad uh, and uh, some other refinements. Uh, but the, the original idea of doing this was, say, with Chugate and uh, Dan Roy, Carolina, Chugate and Dan Roy. Um, and they already obtained you know, some interesting results. Um, but I, uh, we've, we've produced some uh, tighter results in some of our experiments. So, um, so the posterior distributions are trained using these loss functions that reflect the back phase bounds. Um, I won't go into derivations. Uh, the compromises here are we need to turn it into a form where we have a, a direct bound on the uh, on the on the test error. So you know the implicit ones we get where we use the delta function or the KL uh, term between training and test error. Uh, um, um, Ola, I'm not sure what you mean by a BNN. Could you, sorry, I'm just looking in the chat for a question. Uh, a Bayesian neural net? Is that what you mean? Um, anyway, yeah, I mean, we're certainly considering a, a stochastic neural net or a distribution over the weights. And we'll, we'll make explicit that. The other thing we've done here is using a cross validation error as our you know, empirical error rather than the zero one error. But when we come to do model selection, we'll actually use a full normal um, uh, pack based bound with the zero one error uh, and the uh, you know, KL divergence uh, between the distributions, which is as it's here, okay. Um, so these are the, the training like uh, uh, criteria, loss functions. Um, and here we can see for MNIST some of the results. Um, so the colored plots give you the risk certificate, okay. Um, the black line here is the uh, uh, the standard training procedure that would, you know, basically stochastic gradient descent on the uh, empirical risk minimization. Um, and the shaded part are the errors that we get when we use these alternative methods. So the test errors are less tight, but the bounds are, you know, obviously we don't have bounds for the, uh, well, not obviously, but it turns out you cannot we apply the pack base to this, but well, we don't have a distribution for start, but even if we try to put a distribution on it, the bounds are, are uh, you know, very weak. Uh, because effectively this training criteria, uh, both you know, combining, combining uh, obviously trying to improve the, the empirical error, but this KL term is effectively trying to create flat local minima. So we're looking for Low empirical error with flat local minimum, which is a set of We want the, you know, uh, cast the, the sort of distribution to have large variance in order to make this KL term small. And so that actually, um, of course, it look, makes us look for, for, for you know, flat local minimum. Uh, so, so these are the errors, uh, but these are the bounds. So again, you can see that. You know, here we have an error of just under 0.1, but a bound just over 0.3, so a factor of three. Um, and this is with uh, a random initialized prior. If we learn uh, the prior, we get a similar, you know, um, 
much tighter, uh, sorry, much tighter uh, uh, certificate, but also much better error. We're down to, you know, the uh, this is much, much closer to the uh, um, stochastic gradient descent. Um, the FBBB is a bit of a heuristic because there's this eta in here that's just uh, a heuristic parameter that controls the trade off between this KL term and the. Uh, so it can actually lead to very much, you know, very good uh, test set performance, but the corresponding bound is much weaker. Um, but here you can see the factors are, you know, uh, very small between the test error and the certificate. Uh, not much bigger than uh, one point something. Um, I should say that the empirical error here is has to be estimated by random sampling. We don't have the closed form luxury that we had in the case of this four vector machine. Uh, yeah, sorry, Ola. Yeah, Bayesian, you're on that. So uh, this BBB is sort of sort of a Bayesian. Uh, oh, sorry, Bayesian backdrop. So no, this I guess is is not really a Bayesian neural network, but it is a network distribution. So in that sense, it's it's again similar in the sense that we're trying to keep track of distributions over the weights. Um, and in that sense, yes, it's similar to a Bayesian neural network, but not, a, not identical. Um, so if we apply the uh, convolutional neural net, uh, we get very similar uh, performance in terms of if we take a randomized initial prior as opposed to a learned prior, uh, we do much better. Um, again, matching very closely the, um, the uh, classic gradient descent bands. So this is for MNIST, which obviously is quite a simple data set. But we've also got results for CIFAR 10, which is a, a bit more challenging. Um, and we've also looked at, uh, here we've looked just at CNNs, but we've actually uh, looked at different numbers of layers to see whether adding layers would weaken the bounds. And also looked at different percentage of data for uh, training the prior 50% or 70%. Um, and uh, interestingly, by increasing the number of layers, we've actually not damaged the performance significantly. Um, and indeed, you know, it would appear that they've actually you know, um, tightened the performance. Um, so it doesn't appear that introducing that extra complexity has hurt the uh, back based methods. Um, So here, there's a question from, uh, sorry, uh, there's a couple of questions. So Priam Lim has asked, forgive me to interrupt, is there a reason why we can choose prior after seeing part of the data in deep learning, while we choose prior of pack bays before seeing the data in the country? Okay, no, I mean, the, like the, this was a uh, point, sorry, Priam, I'm gonna go back to where I did this for the, um, so it's the same, exactly the same idea as in this SVM case where we had the prior was learnt by part of the data, WR, and the posterior is trained possibly with all the data, but uh, we evaluate the band only with the data that was not involved in training the prior. So if you remember here, we had uh, our data points that were used to train the prior, eta wr here, but the data that was used to evaluate the band um, here in the queue is just the m minus r, the data points that were not used and so were not seen by the prior. And similarly here, we're only dividing by m minus r um, because we're only got m minus r uncontaminated points that are genuinely uh, novel data. So again, the fact that we've used the prior data to train W doesn't matter. It's just when we're evaluating the bound, we mustn't use the prior data to in this stochastic or, or, or in this term here. So I hope that's, I hope that's clear. 
Um, and then there's a question, how can we get KL of Q, Q0? Um, well, because we're using Gaussian distributions, uh, this is really quite straightforward. Well, I mean, in the case I showed with the um, SVNs, uh, it was particularly simple um, because uh, these were just two Gaussian distributions with the same covariant structure. But if you remember, when I moved to the rugby ball SVM, uh, there was this slightly more complex term here that the rows, because if you have the KL divergence between two general Gaussians, um, then uh, it becomes slightly more complex. But it's really not, uh, because it's these are, in the deep learning case, it's a, uh, a diagonal covariance matrix. It's really not a complicated computation. So it's very easy to compute the KL divergence between these two distributions. Um, so then Mark, uh, Kavan was asking, is there any sample set so we can check the accuracy and F1 score? Um, uh, you, you mean you'd like to run these experiments yourself, Mark? Is that what you meant? Or, so, um, okay, I'll wait for the answer on that. Um, so yeah, to continue here, um, it's, I think, you know, we're actually seeing in these very deep networks, the performance of the um, classifiers generated by the uh, pack base uh, loss functions, uh, actually matching that of the, uh, of the stochastic gradient descent. Um, and similarly, we're actually able to generate um, uh, you know, certificates that are extremely close to that of the uh, original, um, sorry, of the, of the true generalization. Um, so I, I think, you know, there's clear evidence here that these bounds are capturing uh, a lot of the, um, let's say, the, the properties of the network that are crucial for generalization. I mean, I don't think you could expect to see bounds of, as tight as that if you know there were key properties being missed. Um, however, you know there are caveats. I should say, you know, first of all, the fact that we don't have a bound for the uh, ERM, you know, the stochastic gradient descent model, tells us that you know it it's able to drive to a solution where the bounds work, but not every good generalizer is able to generate, you know, we're not able to generate a corresponding bound for every every uh, weight vector that is a good generalizer. Um, and uh, I think it's fair to say that we would like to be able to see uh, less of the data used for the prior so that more learning takes place. And we're, we're experimenting with this. More learning takes place, if you like, with the uh, pack based motivated uh, method parts of the day, you know, parts of the training. Um, but nonetheless, you know, these are still very reassuring in terms of the, the, the kind of indication that the pack based bounds are capturing uh, critical properties of the of the uh, of the of the models. Um, so yeah, I mean, Mark, uh, I, I think if you're wanting to get more examples or you know try to run some of these, just drop me an email and I can put you in touch with Maria who did these experiments and she'll be very happy to share some of the details or uh, the code with you if that's something we've done. And I think that's the question I'll ask and hope uh, if not, let me know. Um, okay, so, <clears throat> Uh, I'm going to finish by just sort of outlining some of the other applications that have been made of that case, um, because I want to emphasize that it's, uh, it's certainly not something that, uh, you know, is it, only being done for classification or only for support vector machines or whatever, or, or these recent results. It's, 
it's quite a general uh, framework. It's been applied in a lot of different uh, applications. Um, and I think it's fair to say that uh, I don't think it's, you know, it's we've squeezed all the juice out of it yet in the West. So I think there's, there's plenty more that could be, uh, could be, uh, could be done and, and different applications. So um, in general statistical learning theory terms, these are some of the references. Um, uh, so maybe just mentioned Siga is one of the key contributors here. Um, uh, Maura was the one I mentioned who, who I couldn't remember his name earlier, who had proved the tighter two square root of M bound. Olivia Catoni I mentioned, um, Benjamin Gedge. Um, this, I work with Bob Williamson was very early stuff where we showed uh, the good bound generalization in principle with uh, sort of space in parameter space, even if you had a much more flexible function class. So they kind of set the scene that somehow you could potentially get generalization bounds that would work even in these over parameterized classes. Um, and then SVM and linear classifiers, we've I mentioned some of them. Uh, John Lankford and I did one of the first ones in support that to uh, bounds. Um, so uh, this is some of the work on the, the, the prior learning um, and uh, we're interpreting as bound minimizers, um, high dimensional regression, uh, again, interesting applications. Uh, classification, obviously, we, you know, some of these results uh, with the experiments on the support vector machines uh, was immediate uh, in the numbers. Um, transductive learning and domain adaptation, again, I think these are areas that are very topical and interesting in this uh, work that has been done uh, trying to apply uh, that days in that area. Um, non IID uh, data or heavy tail data, again, there's uh, work that has shown how to handle some of those uh, situations, but certainly not complete. Um, I did some work on density estimation, as did Selden and Tishby. Um, reinforcement learning, there has been a bit of work. Um, sequential learning, uh, algorithmic stability and differential privacy. Again, uh, Carolina Gigati and Dan Roy. Um, and then the work with deep neural networks I already mentioned, Jugati and Ben Roy, uh, and so on. Um, okay, and then I've, I've put references, I've made the uh, slides available so you can pick those up. So I'm now gonna to go to the questions. Um, uh, So what I, what I meant to say, so this first question from Andrea, I didn't understand what you just said, it's fair to say, are you saying that you cannot compute a good bound for all learning classifiers? These bounds look quite impressively good. Yeah, no, that's exactly what I'm saying, Andrea. What I'm saying is that we, you know, if you look at this, uh, there are bounds, they're very good for these classifiers we've trained in a specific way. But if you look at, say, the uh, function that you generate with, stochastic gradient descent, which is this black line here, um, and try to apply the bound uh, method to that, you can't define a distribution that will give you a tight bound. You need to have the training. Uh, essentially, it doesn't converge to a sufficiently flat local minimum. I think it's my intuition about why. Um, so even though it does perform very well, it doesn't seem that the bound is able to capture that uh, explicitly that property. So the bound is clearly missing something in terms of why that you know, particular training method is doing so well. Um, uh, so then another question from Andrea, what exactly, where exactly in the proof of the general theorem do we use the fact that P does not depend on the data? Okay, good question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, it's essentially when we do this, uh, 
uh, swap, you know, the expectation swap. So if the prior depended on the data, then we couldn't make that swap um, between the expectations. Uh, so again, you know, here we could, if we left it at this point, we could have a packed phase bound that uh, was valid for non-IID data. And then the question is, how would you actually evaluate this uh, expression? Uh, and the way we do it is to make use of the IID property uh, to, um, uh, as I say, to make this swap. But it certainly, you know, there are papers that have looked at avoiding doing that swap and trying to bound this here directly, uh, which can be done in some cases. Um, so question number two, what's the paper with the impressive CNN results? Uh, well, it's uh, in preparation. Uh, so these are quite new results. Um, I think we've put it up as, a, as an archive paper, but uh, I'd better um, uh, try and get you a reference for that. Okay, I should have put that in there, that's true. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, I guess, uh, Wendy, Mandy, can I, you know, send uh, information to the attendees after the event? Maybe I can distribute further information. Uh, hi, John. I'm Yang Huan. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, hi. Yeah, I, I think you can. Uh, uh, if the information is short, you can just type type that in the chat uh, chat box of uh, Zoom, and I can uh, copy paste that to to the students. Yeah, no, what I meant was I'll have to go offline to do it. I'll, I'll send it to you tomorrow if that's okay. Ah, uh, okay. I, I, I think, Man, Mandy, we can send that uh, 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 in, in our e e emails to the students, right? Uh, oh, uh, okay. Anyway, I, I think that, uh, yeah, I think that is doable. Okay. Okay. Okay, no problem. I'll, I'll, I'll try to make sure that that comes through tomorrow. No problem. Um, okay. okay. So then question number three from Andrea was in the deep learning application, you said that you know we're not dealing with BNN, that raising the network. The reason is that we consider a prior distribution on the way, but of course, the distribution is not obtained by an approximation to the base rule. Correct. Correct. Yes, exactly. Yes. Um, they're using a different approach. It seems pack-based learning has overcome most of the weaknesses of pack learning. This is Chi Luang Liu. Um, what is the limitation of pack-based learning? Um, what, and what do you think is the next step of learning theory? What is missing in learning theory? Okay, uh, nice question. Um, so um, I think, yeah, well, limitations, I, mean, I, I mentioned a few, the non-IAD, I mean, the IAD, requirement is, is a significant limitation, I think. Um, you know, I've also mentioned the fact that it doesn't appear to give good bounds for, um, uh, sorry, lost that. Uh, it doesn't appear to give good bounds for the um, ERM case here. Um, you know, so this, this line here, you can't get bounds for. So clearly, it's not capturing everything about, I mean, I, you know, an ideal band would be, you show me any function and I will tell you, you know, how well it's going to do on new data uh, and it will be, you know, well aligned and right. Um, that's clearly not the case. Um, I think the, uh, the thing that's much more interesting and, and, and significant is when we have, you know, these domain shifts, you know, reinforcement learning, for example, the learning through interacting and the, the, the data distribution is continually changing as a result of our actions and the state that we are in. How can we handle that? We're still learning from data, but we're learning from data that is sort of distributed across different states uh, from different parts of our experience. And how do we uh, factor all of those influences into the uh, inferences that we make? Um, in a way that will, uh, you know, accurately make us able to accurately predict how well we do in novel situations. So these are, you know, quite 
uh, much more complex learning scenarios, what I'm saying. Um, you know, to some extent, domain adaptation has something of that feel. You're learning in one distribution and suddenly you're trying to actually apply it in a, a different uh, environment. But, you know, it's the same problem, but the lighting's different, the, uh, some other factors may be different, maybe some instrumentation that works slightly differently in a different environment, etc. Um, are you able to make those shifts effectively? Um, so it's where you have perhaps, uh, you know, something of the kind of problem that, uh, you know, some of these basic assumptions are breaking down, but not completely. And you have to somehow, you know, understand what the effect of that is. I think the other thing that I would highlight as, you know, a weakness is um, how do we build in better prior knowledge? You know, what I've done here is, you know, split the data in two. But, you know, many, as I suggested earlier, there may be situations where we have some physical knowledge of the situation that we could build in. Um, and that should inform a much better um, bound, presumably, in that we are able to, you know, uh, forego a lot of the learning that we might otherwise require. Um, I think we, you know, the typical thing we've seen in uh, uh, applications is also this reduction of the amount of learning required to learn a new concept, you know, one, one stop learning or zero shot learning. Um, how do we bound that kind of, you know, situation? Are we able to capture something about the, um, the representation? So, we're, you know, it's about learning representations that are future-proofed against new tasks that may involve using that representation. Again, that's something that there is some work on, but not a great deal. Um, and I just certainly don't think we're seeing, you know, very tight bounds in that uh, area. Um, so those are just some of the areas where I think we, you know, we have, uh, you know, a huge amount still to do. I mean, I, my kind of general feeling is, you know, statistical learning theory limps along behind to some extent, you know, the, some, some heuristic shows itself as very effective, you know, maybe large margin or deep learning or whatever. And then, you know, statistical learning theory tries to analyze and understand what's happening um, and hopefully contributes in terms of kind of clarifying certain things, prioritizing others, and, you know, perhaps points the way forward. Uh, but typically it's a few steps behind the, the intuitions of the practitioners who are actually making these things work. Um, so those would be my summary of the weaknesses of pack bays um, and learning theory in general. Um, and also some of the next steps of learning theory. Um, then Andrea asks, there's something I'm missing. You say that the pack rate framework is not giving tight bounds to the cut I learned by ERM, by STP. However, on page 64, I think we get impressively tight bounds, don't we? Um, I guess that's here. Um, but the, except for BBB. No, but Andrea, sorry, this is, I haven't been clear enough here. Uh, the type, the bounds are for these F quad classifier and the F lambda classifier and the F classic classifier, not for this FERM classifier. So this FERM classifier is the one if you just apply F uh, stochastic gradient descent to the whole data set, ignore any prior learning, etc. You just train normal SGD on the whole data set and just learn a weight vector, right? And that's the performance you get. Um, but you don't have a corresponding band because you didn't train with the pack base criteria to optimize the band. And FBB is sort of somewhere in between because the criterion isn't exactly a pack base band, so you end up with a much weaker band, um, but sometimes actually a better classifier. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, 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 uh, I hope that's, that's clear uh, now. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we are closely matching the FERM, but we don't have a bound for the particular FERM. That's the point I'm, I'm making. So the, 
the bounds apply to other classifiers that we've trained in a different way. Maybe they're better than FELM, I don't know. I have slightly worse um, generalization in those cases. Maybe they're more robust. We haven't tested that. Right? It's something I think we should be testing uh, to you know, noise and so on, because they are uh, typically, I think, in flatter local minima. So they may have other properties that are good, but they're not, uh, they're not the FERM classifiers. Um, can we consider pre-training or self-supervised learning as a way to obtain better fire without labor data? I think so. Yeah. So that's certainly, you know, that's, you know, you could say learning a distribution, learn it, fine, you know, do whatever you like, however you like, and then fix that. Um, and then just have a much simpler classifier on top, which you learn with much less data, and you can bound that performance because all of that prior learning, it was done before you actually saw the training data for the uh, final classification problem. So you could definitely do that. Um, uh, Chi Luen asked that question. Um, uh, and Huang Kie asked, may I have a question? Is it always converged with SVM? If not, which technique should be used to solve the problem? Um, uh, do you mean, I'm not quite sure what you mean there. I mean, certainly these were trained to convergence, if that's what you mean. With an SVM, you know, that's the benefit of an SVM is you have a global local minimum and you can find it as opposed to a deep learning system where you typically learn for local minimum. Um, so in all of those cases, also for this prior SVM, these are all convex problems that you can solve exactly. So these were all solved um, with, uh, so these results that I've showed here were based on solving those problems exactly. Um, um, I mean, I, I've left out details, of course, because there's, you know, for example, the question of um, doing model selection, how many Cs and signals um, were, were chosen, you know, what was the, but, you know, I kind of left that out. But I mean, you can refer to the original papers there in your references. Um, is that? Does that answer your question, Wang? Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm not quite sure if I've understood your question properly. Um, okay, John, uh, this is Yan Huan. I right. think, uh, yeah, I think uh, I don't see an, any further questions. Uh, okay. I, okay, I personally have one question. Uh, I, I also work on a, a sequential decision or adversary online learning. And there, yeah. one, one very important algorithm uh, is a multiplicative weight update or exponential yeah. weight. And the, yeah. that algorithm looks very similar to, or, or, or basically exactly the same as the Gibbs uh, estimator that uh, minimizes the pack base bound. Okay. Right. And, uh, uh, however, the model the multiplication <clears throat> weight update algorithm works in the non-probabilistic world, or pack base works in the statistical learning world. And mm -hmm. how do you uh, elaborate on this uh, relation or the curious similarity? Uh, yeah. So there was some work. I mean, yeah. Okay. So this is more like mixture of experts, I guess. Right. Uh, mm -hmm you're talking about and the multiplicative update algorithm yeah uh, yeah um so uh i mean there are two there's a few differences so yeah i mean obviously it's a sequential um, mm -hmm. and it's also in the adversarial setting so you know you're not even assuming a distribution generating the data let alone a, not an iid distribution um and so you're you're talking about worst case Scenario. So I think what you're asking really is what, what is the similarity in terms of this uh, yeah, or, 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 distribution, right? Yeah, or, or, or let me refine my question. 
So why, why do this uh, alg uh, algorithmic form appear in two seemingly very different scenarios? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, it's, it's an interesting, yeah, interesting question. I mean, that, that when I referred to that uh, work by Olivier Catoni on learning the, um, the prior uh, distribution dependent prior, Actually, his distribution dependent prior was a Gibbs distribution uh, with the true error. So if you think about the true error of a classifier, you make a Gibbs distribution based on that. And the posterior distribution is the Gibbs error based on the empirical uh, distribution. Uh, so although you couldn't compute the prior, you could bound the KL divergence between prior and posterior, those two distributions from Mark uh, and we actually did some work on that as well. Um, however, the, the band turned out not to be as tight as you might expect it to be. Um, but the Gibbs distribution did come in there in a very natural way uh, because of the way in which you might weight a distribution of errors. And I think in that sense, it's, uh, you know, you might view your deterministic algorithm as a, as a kind of, um, de-randomization mm -hmm. <laughs> of the pack base bound, maybe, I don't know. I mean, it would huh? be very interesting to think of it as in that way, you know, some sort of de-randomization technique. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but it, yeah, you're right. I mean, there is a very kind of uh, close, uh, apparent close relationship between the two mm -hmm. um, uh, in terms of, you know, but, but, but equally, maybe you could think of the, uh, you know, the, multiplicative updates as in some way keeping the distribution over the possible uh, functions that might be applicable in that case, I suppose, uh, uh, you know, your sort of belief in the, you know, your distribution of belief in the exports. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, uh, okay, first I, I, I saw that uh, Huang Hiop uh, said, thank you very much, so I suppose uh, you have answered his question. Okay, okay good. And the and I see one more question from uh, Andrea. Uh huh. Okay. Okay. I I I I think the staff has not uh, copy past this question, or I can do that for for you. Uh, wait. Okay, I've got it. Yeah, this is the question from uh, Andrea again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if the analogy makes sense, but the tension between the KL term and the fact they found and the necessity to make R out Q small, actually R in Q small, uh, should be seen similar to the competition between the reconstruction loss and the KL term loss in the training of a variation or also encoding. In other words, it looks like KL divergence plays the role of a regularizer on Q. Does this make sense completely? Yes, absolutely. It's exactly that. I mean, the KL term is sort of regularizing us to not move too far from the prior. Um, and that is exactly the tension, but uh, maybe I can go back to that slide quickly. Um, um, you go to that, the original. So, you know, here you've got this the moving part is Q um, because it applies for Q. Um, you want to band R out Q as tightly as possible. And there are two things that are allowing R out Q to grow. One is if R in Q grows, and the other is if this KL QP grows. So you need to kind of keep this small and keep this small at the same time. Um, and the tension is, you know, you have to move away from P to make this small, um, but move as slightly away as possible uh, in order to make, uh, you know, this term, keep this term not too big and make this term smaller. And it's kind of, um, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's a very uh, surprising sometimes that uh, different things you can do, you know, like, for example, that, uh, um, rugby ball trick that apparently gave us a win-win situation. We were much more flexible in how we could choose Q um, uh, by having that more flexible prior P that sort of elongated 
and apparently almost no cost in terms of the KL term, uh, but it would allow us to give uh, you know, a much cheaper way of getting to a good queue uh, for this um, empirical. Uh, so they, yeah, that's exactly the correct interpretation uh, that you have there, uh, Andrea. Great, I mean, thanks by the way for all the great questions. It's been really, um, really interesting. And if you do, uh, you know, when you're laying awake at nights, uh, think of another question, don't yeah, feel free to uh, okay. Uh, John. Okay, John. Uh, uh, we, uh, we have a general question for each uh, lecturer of machine learning okay. school. Sure. Okay. Uh, okay. The question is: uh, uh, Could you give some advice to the students attending machine learning summer school regarding how to learn machine learning? Oh, okay. <laughs> um, gosh. Um, well, I, I think. I think you know machine learning is a practical discipline. You know, that, that, that I'm, a, I'm a theoretician saying that, so you know, I, I guess I, I definitely think it. Um, but it's it's a very interesting mix of theory and practice, which you know is what attracts me to it. You know, I'm, I started out as a mathematician, I guess, and you know, somehow actually having you know a way of seeing the effect of theory and practice is is I think very rewarding, and but also very uh, challenging. Uh, so I kind of often say, you know, it's the, um, the lazy theoretician who doesn't bother to make his theory practical. <laughs> it's the lazy practical guy who doesn't bother to, you know, check the theory out. So I would encourage you to do both. Is what I would say is, you know, sort of promoting the theory angle here a little bit. But I do think it's 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 uh, you know a very interesting mix and trying to kind of, you know test the theories with practical experiments and when you see practical things working try to understand the theoretical justification for those practical uh, successes you know that's where the real action is in my view in terms of advancing the field because if we can see general patterns from those uh, you know practical experiments then we can you know extend them beyond that particular application in many interesting ways potentially um so yeah i i, I think it's a great deal I mean, you know it's hyped to the <laughs> nth degree at the moment um but uh you know uh the proof of the pudding is in the eating and people are using it in, in practice and it's delivering i'm not sure it's always delivering good things for humanity i hope it will deliver more good things for humanity and less challenging things, uh, but I do think it's, you know, it's a hugely, uh, has a, a, you know, it's technology with huge potential, both in practical terms and, uh, as I say, I think from adding the theory dimension and, and thinking about theoretical challenges is actually both exciting and challenging and uh, rewarding. So I think those would be my, my thoughts. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I also I also agree that the interaction between theory and the practice is the most fascinating part. Okay, uh, this ends this session. Uh, thank you everyone for your questions and uh, also thank you John for the, for this wonderful uh, lecture. Right, it's been a pleasure to join you all and really sorry I wasn't, you know, we weren't able to meet in, in uh, physically in, in Taipei, but uh, maybe another time. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you.